The Zwift cheating video has gained a lot of traction in the last few weeks. For that video, there was a lot of video footage and explanations that never got to be used. What follows is the most common crank arm string gauge design. While some companies have moved on to trying to use compensation techniques, others have not. While some reviewers may be able to find them, some reviewers cannot. And in fact, the review needs to be based on more than just one unit because the response and the accuracy is going to be affected by the crank arm that it's on and not just the electronics and calibration. Is it accurate? And in a lot of cases, one tester or one reviewer with, with some undocumented methodology throwing them on a bike a few times and going, yeah, they line up with other meters. It's not great, but it's not necessarily going to highlight issues, especially if they're not a cyclist who can cause the issues. So one of the big issues has to do with the asymmetry of a crank arm. And what I mean is, if this is a section here through the crank arm, the top and the bottom are not the exact, and I mean exact same shape, and same in this direction. So you need two axes of symmetry to make a highly predictable structure. And in order to turn these into a power meter, they normally put a strain gauge arrangement with two strain gauges at the top, two at the bottom, so that when you bend it, there's two in tension, two in compression, and they electrically make what's called a Wheatstone bridge. But you only see the output from the whole bridge. You don't see, and you can't see in that arrangement, any individual output of a strain gauge. So, in order to do a calibration, you might hang a weight when it's in the horizontal position, pure torque, uh, one kilo, 9.81 meters per second squared for gravity, the crank arm length, and we know that we have 1.7 newton meters of torque. So in the Wheatstone bridge, we get we might get this type of arrangement. We we've simplified it here for only two string gauges, but there are zeros. The change is plus one and minus 1.1, and that's because when you apply here, this lower section is less stiff than the upper section, so it's going to compress more than the top. But all those power meters can see is 2.1. We knew that torque, we know what that sensor gives us, we come up with the calibration factor. But now we apply a force in the axial direction along the length of the crank. And let's say when we did that, we use one kilo, um, it's not a torque, really, although you can look at this offset. 9.81 meters per second for gravity, and so we know the newtons, and we probably get 1 and 3. Uh, and both of them are stretching. Remember, this one's going to stretch more because it's less stiff at that lower side. But in a real cycling scenario, that your axial force isn't usually in the same league as the amount of force you're applying for through the rotation. So if we use 0.1 of a kilo, and we run through all the math, what the power meter is going to see is 2.9. We multiply that by our calibration factor, we get 2.35 newton meters. But we know that we're only applying one kilo of force this distance, so we should be reading 1.7. That's a huge difference. That, that is empirically, absolutely, teetotally, 100% false. We know that for a fact, and yet there are multiple products in the market that use this scenario. The reality is some people don't produce enough axial force for this to be noticeable. Uh, the vast majority of people don't, but some cyclists do. But some cyclists produce high axial force in one direction on the downstroke, but also oh, in the opposite direction on the other side of the stroke, thus canceling because it's averaged out throughout the pedal rotation. So there's all sorts of issues. This is just one of those issues, but it means things like the higher the asymmetry, the worse in terms of absolute accuracy a power meter is going to be. So the more wide, the more asymmetric, the more convoluted the shape is, the worse you're going to have in terms of absolute accuracy. On one day, one cyclist can get out on, on it and it looks great. 
But on another day, or if that person changes their bike fit, or they change their pedals, or they change their shoes, or they're just having an off day, or they had some muscle pain, not only is their number, their power going to change because this axial force is going to change, you're also going to be able to think things like, oh man, my power dropped off by 3%, when it could be your pedaling style changed, you're, you're feeling fatigued, you have a muscle ache, you're not sitting on the bike correctly, or your bike is not properly set up. So essentially anything that uses a basic simple bending arrangement on an asymmetric crank has the potential for very low accuracy. Generally good repeatability, but in terms of absolute accuracy, it's not good. They're going to have good precision, they'll, they'll be repeatable, but that impact from that axial is always there. So in order to talk about racing, you have to talk about having accurate numbers, and, and it's no longer for them to be consistent, which is the industry terminology for precision in, the, in this category, but you need absolute accuracy, and it mustn't be affected by the model of the crank arm that it's on. Or if it is, then those high asymmetric, highly variable power meters must now be excluded from racing events. And it's the only way to try and level the playing field. So there needs to be methodologies in place to determine accuracy. And essentially, some independent body needs to constantly look for the flaws. And it can't just look at the flaws of one design on one style of crank arm and then blanket approve everything else. Every single crank arm, especially anything that uses a bending arrangement, is susceptible. And the general likelihood of, of any with a simple basic bending arrangement being able to pass absolute validation is very, very, very slim. So there are a handful of uh, power meters on the market now that have improved things. Um, that are looking at supplementing these gauge setups. Some of them are better than others. It all starts to, to come down to their calibrations. But when you have a basic bending arrangement, if it's tested and it reads high or low, it's not calibration. And if they send you a firmware update saying they fixed it, it's likely that they just juiced your cals. They either increased your calibrations or decreased your calibrations to make it align with what you expected. Because if they only have a bending arrangement, they can only see this number. They can only see this number. When this affects it, they cannot, in any absolute terms, remove that data. They can't remove that error caused by that unless they add more sensors. So, this in and of itself is a major flaw in terms of racing in a digital age.